beautiful people. My name is Terry. I'm one of the pastors here. And if it's your first time, welcome. We're really excited that you are here, especially if you were invited by a friend or if you were just passing by. We're just glad you're a part of our church today as we continue a message series entitled Basic Training. And uh, to kind of catch you up to speed, um, we, we've been talking about the fact that um, if you are a follower of Jesus, there are different categories or components of the faith that are primary, right? There, there's a lot of different aspects of the Christian faith that you can apply to your lives, you know, whether it's going on a mission trip or whether it's doing a devotional at night, doing a Bible study during the week. There's a lot of different components of the faith. But there are those basic fundamental truths within the Christian faith that all of Along our years, as we kind of grow and as we kind of move, um, they're important. They're important to us for a lot of reasons, whether it's to represent them, whether it's to speak of them, or whether it's to embody them, they are important. And isn't it true that um, all of a sudden, if you say that you want to be a follower of Jesus, um, you might think of those or be introduced to those, but then all of a sudden you wake up after 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and you look back at those components of those categories and you say, oh, you know what, I'm not doing that or we're not doing that or that's not a part of our lives and no wonder why we kind of feel that we're a little off kilter. So we've been talking all month long about those fundamentals. The first week we talked about the importance of community, that the Christian life was never meant to be lived alone. And so we talked about the importance of getting into a faith community, not just a large body of Christ, but just a group of individuals that can challenge you, pray for you, encourage you. My wife and I, we have a group that we meet with on a consistent basis, and I thank God for them because, again, we need individuals that know us personally and can challenge us and encourage us. Then last week, we talked about the importance of how we frame the Christian life. Um, isn't it true that we have a lot of Christians that don't do the Christian life justice? You know, you ask them, hey, how's your day? Terrible. It's like, hey, you know, you know don't you think that today's going to be a great day? No. And it's like, wow, I really want to be a Christian. Yeah, no, you know. So we have to frame life, you know, and we say if you're a follower of Jesus, the great thing that we know is no matter what difficulty you're facing, you can know this, that you know what, if today's my day, if today I go to be with Jesus, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to spend eternity with him. And so I can start with that as my hope, and that can filter down, and I can frame life through that. And today I'm really excited because there, there is a category that many of us in this room um, that we understand that is vitally important. But if you're not a Christian, I want to kind of give you a heads up on this, okay? There is a component that we are supposed to make sure we have as a part of our Christian faith. But there are some individuals of this room that will say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and what they've done is, because of maybe culture, because of maybe time, because of maybe tradition, or maybe because of family pressure, we, we just kind of say, well, it's not that important. It's, it's not that important. It's not a big deal. And we, and we compartmentalize it and we put it into a place where we, we run from it. We don't want to talk about it. When it's brought up, we get nervous. Like right now that I'm talking about something and you don't know what it is, but you might think that you think that you know what it is. You're starting to sweat and you're not liking this right now. I know. And so what happens is, is, is we just put it in that place and we, don't, we just leave it there. And, and it's, we, don't, we don't wrestle with it. And that's not a good place for it to be. Well, here's the great thing. The great thing is, is we have a church that is made up of many different denominations. We have Methodist, Presbyterian, we have Catholic, we have Lutheran, um, <clears throat> we have non-denominational. We have all different individuals that make up this church, and, and we are a Baptist church of a Baptist faith. But what I love is, is that we don't center on denomination. Because what we understand and we know is many different denominations make up the 
body, the big capital C body of Christ. Now, we might defer on, on different theological aspects, and we might have different opinions on them, but many different denominations, we, we all agree that Jesus is the Son of God. He died for our sins, and he raised so that we can one day be with Jesus and be with his Father. We, we agree on that, and that's why I love this. But this one category that we're going to talk about today, this is one of those categories that many different denominations have different ways of doing it, different ways of talking about it, and different ways of thinking about it. So, I'm excited to introduce it to you for a couple reasons. One, if you're not a Christian, you're going to learn about why this is important. Two, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're going to learn the importance of it. But three, if you are a follower of Jesus and you already have embodied this and you have this as a part of your life, then you can't tune out and go to sleep. Because... There are many people who have questions about this category, and we do a terrible job of explaining it as Christians. So today, we're going to unpack it. We're going to teach about it. We're going to give you everything around it so that you can either make a decision to make it a part of your lives, or you can represent it the way that Christ would call us to, okay? So some of you are like, get to it. Okay. The way that we're going to do this message this week is very simple. I thought, let's be straightforward. We're going to do question and answer. And so the way the message is written, there's going to be a question, and then we're going to unpack that question. We're going to answer it for us so we can walk out of here with a lot of great information and knowledge about the faith. So the category is in this question, and the first question that we're going to answer today is, where did the term baptism come from? Some of you right now are sweating. Oh, great. But where did the term baptism come from? So let's learn together because I'm going to take you to the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. Just south of the Sea of Galilee, it dumps into the Jordan River. And there's a guy by the name of John, and he's standing in the Jordan River, and he has individuals coming to him, and he's starting to baptize them. So let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness, and he began preaching. And his message was this, Repent, hold on to that, of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You see, the prophet Isaiah was speaking about John way back in the day when he said this, he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. So there's a few aspects here when we ask the question, where did baptism come from? Now, John is there, he's standing in the river, and baptism is happening. Now, this was not uncommon. And let me give you some context, okay? This is fascinating. So back in the day, there were individuals who were known as Gentiles. We understand that term today. Gentile is anything other than Jewish. So you had a lot of Jewish individuals that were in this region, and every once in a while, they would see someone be baptized. And that when you saw baptism happen, it always meant this. There is a Gentile who understands that there is a God, the Jewish God, the Israelite God, monotheistic, one God, and they recognize his power, and they say, you know what? I want to worship that God. And so the individuals, through Jewish friends, would be baptized, and they would adopt Judaism. And so you had Pharisees and Sadducees. These were religious leaders, right? And they were standing around, hanging around the Sea of Galilee. And all of a sudden, they saw John, who looks a little weird. He's dressed a little funky. Okay, let's just be honest. And he's standing in the Jordan River, and he's baptizing a whole bunch of people. And they're like, wow, man, there's a crowd there. Hey, he's got a lot of people there. He's like, you know, we don't know what he's teaching, but, you know, there's baptism happening. So then all of a sudden, one of the Pharisees, this is, by the way, Terry's just conjecture story, okay, Bridget. All of a sudden, the Pharisees had to see a guy that they know, and he's walking out of the river, and he's come to them. And they're like, hey, what were you doing out there? I just got baptized. You're Jewish. Why are you getting baptized? That doesn't make sense. You see, the term for a Gentile getting baptized into Judaism was proselyte. If you were a proselyte, proselyte means stranger. And so you were a stranger to the faith, and you were baptized into Judaism to become a part of the family. Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees are looking, and there is a Jewish person who is baptized. This doesn't make sense. You're not a stranger to Judaism. Why are you getting baptized? Then they start talking about John is teaching an amazing lesson. We have it all wrong. We need to listen to John. And that's when the Pharisees and Sadducees go, we need to go figure out what is going on here because this guy, John, is teaching something. You're right. Do you know what John's teaching? John is teaching you must repent of your sins. 
wait a minute. What does repentance have to do with baptism? You see, John was introducing to his Jewish friends and Gentiles friends this, that God wants to have a relationship with us and that sin separates us from God and that in order for us to have a relationship with God, we need to recognize and take ownership of our sin, ask for forgiveness, and then we need to, as a symbol, we need to die to that sin and we need to live a different life. That was John's teaching. By the way, Christians don't give John the Baptist enough credit. We often don't like to talk about John the Baptist because we don't want him to overshadow Jesus. He will never overshadow Jesus because he was partners with Jesus. He made the way for Jesus. And so what I would tell you as a Christian, you need to study John because, man, he was incredible. What an incredible man of faith he was. He prepared the way for Jesus. Now, the Pharisees and Sadducees hear about this. They're like, "This is we got to knock this off. And they start walking out towards John. Take a look what happens in verse 7. It says, but when John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptized, he turned to them and he denounced them and he said, you brood of snakes. Now, I love this. Let me ask you a question, Christian. Let's say all of a sudden you were standing in the neighborhood and then you walked up to your neighbor and your neighbor looked at you and said, you brood of snake. How would you feel? I just want you to understand the context of just what happened. These were the religious leaders. And they're walking out to John. Hey, John, how are you doing? What's going on? You brood of snakes. Heesh. So now it's on, right? I mean, John didn't hold anything back. And he says, you brood of snakes. But I want you to watch what John says next. Take a look. He says, Pharisees, Sadducees, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turn to God. You see, don't just say to one another, we're good, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Powerful. Do you know what John basically just looked at the religious leaders who are supposed to know God's word and have a close relationship with God? He says, you brood of snakes, You can't keep living life saying, hey, I don't have to do anything. I'm Jewish. I'm good. You need to repent of your sin. In other words, John said, no, it's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of just heritage. Heritage matters, but the heart matters more. And now many of us in this room, I love this because Christians are all, we're we're so gullible. Okay, let's just be honest. We're reading that. We're like, yeah, way to go, John. Yeah, get those Pharisees. We Christians do the same thing. We're in the same boat. It's as if John would be looking at us as Christians and he would say the same thing. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know someone that says, I'm a Christian, I went to church all my life, but you're looking at them and you know they don't act like a Christian. They don't do anything like a Christian. They don't follow Jesus at all. In fact, let's be honest, there are many of us in this room watching online or in the balcony that we fall into that category. We walk around and we say, I'm a Christian. You see, my grandfather, he was a pastor. And so, you know what? I'm a grandson of a pastor. So, yes, I'm definitely a Christian. But you don't live life that way. You don't recognize your sin. You don't recognize your dependence. In other words, there's many of us that own our grandparents' faith. We own our parents' faith. We own our pastor's faith. But we don't own any faith. And we walk around like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and we proclaim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And if John the Baptist was here today, he would look right into our eyes and say, you brood of snake. Ow. And I get it. Some of us, you don't like that right now. Right now you're like, I don't like this church. This guy right now, this this is offensive. I know. I know. I know. But the reason why I can say it is because I know what that means. I know what it's like to live life and to say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and I have no idea what my faith is. I was owning my family's faith. I didn't own my faith. If you're a note taker, you need to remember this. You see, there is a big difference between knowing about God and knowing God. One speaks to religion. The other speaks to relationships. This is why you don't see me all the time stand up here and say, that's why I'm a Baptist, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Baptist. You don't see me say that often. Why? Because one speaks to a method and a religion The heart is a relationship matter with God. And once you understand that, yes, denominations are great, yes, it's important to understand theologically what you stand for, but I would tell you this, 
at the end of the day, I would die on a hill for five things, and those five things all matter in the heart. Because it's a heart matter, not a head matter. And so it's important to have that day-to-day relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today, let me ask you a question. Are you those Pharisees and Sadducees? Are you the ones walking to John and saying, John, what are you doing? And then John look at you and say, you know what? You say that you are a man or a woman of faith, but you don't live like a man or woman of faith. So if that's you, now we lean into more and we learn more together because baptism matters, right? So the next question that I would say is, well, then why are we baptized? Okay, Terry, then great. We know where it came from. We know the, the birth of it, but why are we baptized? So let's learn together in verse 11, Matthew 3, 11. John said this, look, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and they turn to God. We got that, right? We already learned that. It's about repents. You go under the water and it's dying to your life of sin and you repent. Got that. Now watch what he says after this. But, you see, someone's coming soon who's greater than me and so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave or carry his sandals. You see, he's going to baptize you with something more. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, this is where many Christians, they do this. I'm out. It's got freaky. In fact, if you're not a Christian, we Christians will read this and we'll get to that Holy Spirit and fire. Yeah, 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 keep moving on because I just can't explain it. I don't understand it. It's kind of weird. And so let's just let's talk about it, okay? I'm not going to show you that passage. We're going to show you other passages. And we just move past it, but it's so powerful. Watch, watch this. Do you know what John the Baptist was saying? John says, look, my emphasis is all on at the symbol of baptism. When you go under the water, it, re- it represents the sinful life that you have and that you recognize that you need to repent. Then when you come out of the water, it, re- it represents, God, forgive me, and I want a close relationship with you. But it is incomplete. And at that time, John's baptism was only water. It was incomplete. And so Holy Spirit and fire is powerful because here's what it means. It means someone's coming and he's going to continue that. I'm going to come up out of the water and then there's hope. Do you know why there's hope? It's because you don't have to do it on your own. This is Christian, lean into this. This is powerful. When you come up out of the water with John, that's it. Hey, good luck now. But now with Jesus, here's what happens. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit descends. When you accept him, you receive the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? It's Jesus in you. So when you have to make a tough decision, what can you do? Spirit, speak. God, speak. When you're walking along and you're about to make a dumb decision, the Holy Spirit prompts you and says, hey, moron, stop it. And so here's what happens. When you're a Christian, you come out of the water and you have the Holy Spirit, you can make wiser decisions, better decisions, and you can live a more fulfilled life. Wow, that's awesome, but it doesn't end there. Because what does fire represent? Fire represents God's Spirit, but it represents eternity. And so, man, if I'm a follower of Jesus, not only do I repent of my sins, no no matter, also I get the Holy Spirit which guides me, but then there's a future hope, and I am a new life. I am a new being. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ for eternity. Whoa, powerful. Do you know there's a guy by the name of Paul? And someone asked this question to him, and they were in Rome. They were having pizza. And they said, hey, tell me about this. And do you know this? I want you to watch what Paul said about baptism. Take a look with me. Paul said this, for we died and we were buried with Christ in baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by his glorious power of the Father, now we also may have what? New lives. And so Jesus came to complete baptism by giving us that total picture of what it means to follow him in life. Oh, that's awesome, right? And I know the next question, for some of you, if you're not a Christian or if you're new to Christianity, so the next question is, wow, Terry, baptism is really, really powerful. It's very, very important. So does baptism then get you into heaven? Very quickly and very emphatically, let me tell you, no. Baptism gets you wet. It does not get you into heaven. Because remember what I said to you earlier, what is it a matter of? It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. This is something, and if you're a Christian, you need to have this memorized because there's many people who are confused by this or they ask questions by this. And by the way, there are some denominations that believe that baptism, if you're not baptized, you can't get to heaven. And I would just look at you theologically and I'll tell you, that's not true. And, and, and I could debunk that in many different ways throughout Scripture. I don't have time to, today to talk all about them, but that is not theologically accurate. 
But here's the statement you need to remember when it comes to baptism. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward commitment. Baptism is an outward picture of what has happened in your heart. That's what baptism is. That's what it is. It doesn't get you into heaven, it just gets you wet. But it's powerful, and it's important, and every follower of Jesus should be baptized. We should make it a priority. And some of you are like, nope, not doing it. Nope, not doing it. Well, don't do it because I told you to do it. Do it because there's someone who gave an example and someone who was told you don't have to do it. And of all people, he had the hall pass. He could have said, you know what, you're right, I don't need to do it. But you know what? He looked and said, no, I must. So if he did it, we've got no excuse, which leads us to our next question. Then, Terry, why did Jesus get baptized? He didn't have to repent, did he? Why did he even have to do it? He should have gotten the hall pass. Well, let's read together and learn together. Matthew chapter 3, 13. It says, Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, but John tried to talk him out of it. He said, Look, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, John said, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. What I love about this is, is Jesus spoke to something that God required. Well, there's a couple things at play here. One, there was a prophet by the name of Isaiah who spoke to this moment in Scripture. And so for this prophecy to become true, Jesus needed to fulfill this prophecy. Otherwise, then here you have Isaiah speaking on behalf of God, saying something's going to happen, and it doesn't happen. Well, God doesn't want that to happen, so he says, no, Jesus, you must go through this because I told him that you were going to do this. That's one. But I love this is because Jesus needed to paint a picture a picture of baptism for all of us. So the picture of baptism was painted by Jesus Christ. Well, Terry, what do you mean by this? Well, let's look together. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. Take a look. It says, After Jesus' baptism, as he came up out of the water, the heavens were opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. Now, two things are at play that are powerful, Christians. Number one, this fulfilled Isaiah 11-2, where it said the Spirit would descend upon him. It also reminds all of us that when you become a follower of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit descends upon you, and you receive his Spirit, and that Spirit guides you. So Jesus gave that picture to remind us. But do you know what else Jesus did, which I love? Jesus said, you know what, I need to get baptized because I am 100% God, but you know what, I'm 100% man as well. And the reason why I'm 100% man and the reason why I'm putting myself through this is because I don't want anybody from Ocean View in 2024 to ever look at me and to ever say this, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. Because he does. There is not anything that you are facing right now that he hasn't faced first. There is not one thing that has happened to you that he's not experienced. And so Jesus said, no, I must be baptized because I'm calling my creation to do this, and so I'm going to do it because I always want my creation to know that I came to seek to serve. I am a savior servant. And so I humble myself as 100% man to come and to be able to know what they're doing. But there's a second thing, and this is where I want you to wake up, Christian, because if you're not a Christian, lean in for a second. This is something I'm about to teach that most Christians don't know. And so they think they know, and they don't know. And so I want you to watch their expression when I unpack this, okay? So the first part of it, they know, but then the second part, they don't. Watch. The other reason why Jesus was baptized is because he wanted to publicly announce the beginning of his ministry and his mission. And so this was the first part. This was him coming and saying, I'm here. I'm the Son of God. That's my Father. You just heard him speak, and I'm here for a purpose. However, it was also an example. And if you get this, go to sleep. If you're a follower of Jesus, do you understand that Jesus Christ modeled announcing his ministry, his purpose, and his mission, which meant this. All eyes were on him after this, and they were watching to see what he was going to do. Do you know that as a follower of Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus and then you're baptized, do you know that you're also announcing your ministry and mission? So here's my million-dollar question to all my Christian friends. Have you announced yours? 
Because I know a lot of people who say yes to Jesus, they get baptized, and then they don't look any different. They don't walk any different. They don't talk any different. I'm a Christian. So I want to ask you right now, um, in the balcony, online, and on the floor, have you announced your ministry and mission? When people look at you post-baptism, do they know that you are on purpose? Do they know that you have a mission? Do they know that you follow Jesus? And only you can answer that question. And if you're sitting in this room and you're a follower of Jesus, here's the question. Have you announced that? Have you been baptized? We'll get to that later. That leads us to our next question. So let me ask this question. What did your baptism actually announce? Because for some of us, it announced that I got wet. So here's a question that I would have for you and you would have for me. When should I get baptized? For those of you in here, you're a follower of Jesus, and maybe you've not been baptized. Or maybe you're like me, and you say, no, 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 I was baptized as a child. I was baptized following Jesus on October 1st, 1995. But I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in the fall of 1993. It took me two years to get baptized. And you might say, Terry, why? And I would say, because I'm a moron. I love you. I appreciate you. That's not true. I appreciate you. I'm being dramatic. I'll be honest with you. I accepted Jesus. I didn't have time to go to church. I played eight ba- baseball games in seven days for three and a half months. So when I accepted Jesus, I was on a baseball team in college and did not have time to go to church because I had to be on the baseball field all day long at my college. But I grew every night and studying the scriptures and reading and learning and following Jesus. And I remember transferring down to my hometown and I remember going to church and all of a sudden at the church they asked me to start teaching Bible study because they recognized I I had gifts as a teacher and I knew the word. And so I started teaching and then all of a sudden I had my pastor come up to me and said, hey, I I was going to invite you to something but there must be a discrepancy here because you're not a member of the church. You see, at this church you needed to... Be a Christian, accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you needed to be baptized in order to be able to be a member of the church. Well, I knew Jesus and I was a Christian, but when they said, hey, have you been baptized as an adult? Meaning, after you've experienced and you've said yes to Jesus, have you then been baptized? And that answer was no. So I just did what a lot of us do when people ask you, have you been baptized? Yeah, I've been baptized as a baby. What? Yeah, I was baptized as a baby. And he asked me, have you been baptized? I said, yeah, I was a baby. (laughs) And that's when I looked at him and he said, did you just say that you were baptized as a baby? Yeah, 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 yeah. And he said, well, and he explained to me and he said, you know, Terry, he said, that's awesome that your parents allowed you to go through the sacrament in your denomination. And what they really were saying, and I would say this to anybody that were like me, really what your parents said is, is that we promise to raise our child to know who Jesus is to raise them in a family that tries to honor God, to raise them in a family that prays for them, that encourages them, to raise them in a church that will support them and encourage them as well. That's what your parents did, and that's awesome, and it's incredible, and it is biblical, and it's incredible. However, you just learned where baptism came from. You just learned what it represents, and I can tell you something, that it's different. So when I looked at him and he said, have you been baptized? I would say, this is a baby, and he said, well, you know the difference, right? And I said, yes, I understand there's a difference, and he says, well, then, are you going to get baptized? No. And then he said, why is it that you don't want to get baptized? And then I thank God for at least the humility in that moment to answer honestly. And this is what I would look at some of you watching a line balcony on the floor if you're feeling the same way. When I ask you the question, why won't you get baptized? And if we're really being honest, we probably have a lot of reasons, but for me, I just answered one word. gave all the excuses in the world and then one of the things that I love is is that I had a pastor who was very very good about not telling me what to do but showing me why I should do it and so I said can you just show me one more time in scripture why it is that someone should come to faith and be baptized he said I'll give you an example 
And he took me to the book of Acts. I'm going to take you there. See, there's a guy by the name of Philip. And Philip loved the Lord. And the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Philip, there's a guy that's down this road. And I want you to go over to him. And I want you to be near him. Because something's going to happen. I need you to be a part of it. And so he walks up next to like a chariot. And there's an Ethiopian eunuch who's sitting in there. And he's got the scriptures open. And he's reading it. And he's scratching his head. And he looks befuddled. And all of a sudden, he asked for Philip to come up and, you know, Philip says, what are you reading? He says, I'm reading the scriptures. He says, but how can I understand it if no one will teach me? And Philip said, well, I'll come up and I'll teach you. So Philip came up and sat with him and started teaching him. And we pick up the story in Acts 8.35. And it says this, so beginning with this same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And as they rode along, they came to some water because the eunuch said, I want Jesus. I love the good news. I accept Jesus. And then the eunuch looks and sees the water. And because he understands that you are to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and then you are to give an outward symbol of an inward commitment, he says this, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized right now? So the eunuch ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip I love the faith of that Ethiopian eunuch. He said, this is what it means to have faith? I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and I, I need to show others? Okay, well, why don't, let's do it right now. I got my servants right here. I don't care if I'm going to embarrass myself. I don't care that I'm not prepared. I don't care that I don't have my bathing suit. I don't care that I have, you know, a dad bod. I don't care. I'll go down, and I'll do it. And he did. Later on in the book of Acts, when it speaks about baptism, there's many different excuses, and I love this in verse 16. Watch what it says. It says, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. So he showed me all that, and I remember looking. His name was Chris, and I just said, fine. And he says, so when are you going to get baptized? I said, well, I'll let you know. He goes, how about next week? And I said, nah. And he goes, next week. I said, okay. So on October 1st, 1995, I walked into the baptistry at the beginning of the service where the pastor forgot that we were having baptism, so I stood in the water for 15 minutes. The heater was broken on the water, so it was freezing. My teeth were chattering so loud, my friend Chris had to hold my shoulder and try and warm me up because what he didn't know is I had a 103-degree fever in the onset of chickenpox. I didn't know it at the time. But I got baptized, and I'll never forget it. It's as if God had wonderful joke to play on me and said, you'll never forget your baptism. But bring it back home. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward commitment. Baptism means you repent of your sins, you die to your old self, you announce your ministry and mission because Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and his Holy Spirit comes upon you and guides you. And because he guides you, you live a better life and you have hope for eternity because this is not the end, it's just the beginning. And that's what you show to everybody else. Because you want to own your faith. You don't want to own your parents' faith, your family's faith, your grandparents' faith. And so you know that if you're a follower of Jesus and you've not been baptized, you have a responsibility. And so I have a final statement I want to give you. For those that say that they are Christians, a lack of baptism can only mean three things. Either it's a lack of belief, an abundance of pride, or extreme procrastination. Can't be anything else. And for those that say that they are Christians, a lack of baptism requires one and only one response. Yes. I say that today to say this. I love you as my brother and sister in Christ and as a pastor. I love you too much to allow you to continue to take this very foundational and amazing aspect of the faith that Jesus Christ himself said, I must do. And I can't allow you to continue to excuse it away with culture, excuse it away with apathy, excuse it away with excuses, because you have a responsibility to own your faith. And when you see God's word and it hits you right in the face, you can't allow your pride to continue to get in the way. The only answer can be yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the power of your word. I thank you, Father, for this moment. And so, God, I I thank you so much for just the prayers right now and the soul-searching happening in this room and online. I can sense it. So, God, I pray for the person that is sitting here right now that has not been baptized and they're fighting. God, I know know what that was like for two years. I did it. God, I pray today that you would not allow the enemy to have any reign in this decision. I pray that they would know, God, 
that this is a spiritual marker in their lives. This allows them the courage and strength to say, I stand for Jesus and I'm going to live a different life. And God, that's what you wanted us to do. So God, I pray that you'd bless the decisions and commitments today. I pray that you'd honor them. And we pray that you receive the glory in Jesus' name.